Hello, I'm Reverend Ruth Van Lillian. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of the Emerald Coast. We are a covenantal community founded on loving kindness and a common devotion to our free faith. We recognize all the earth as sacred ground and we welcome each other into this virtual space. We especially welcome those visiting with us today. We are so glad you're here. We invite you to check out our website and our Facebook page to learn more about us. We hope to touch hearts, teach minds, challenge spirits, and comfort souls. May you find refreshment and restoration in our service today. With humility and courage, born of our history, we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all souls are welcome as blessings and the human family lives whole and reconciled. With this vision in our hearts and minds, we light our chalice. Morning. My name is Sophia Lopez, and I am the Director of Religious Exploration at UUFEC. And we today are reading the story Change Things. This was written by Amanda Gorman, and the pictures are by Lauren Long. Oh, 
gosh, it's awfully bright in here. Let's see, I think if we pull closer, okay. I can hear change humming in its loudest, proudest song. I don't fear change coming, and so I sing along. I scream with the skies of red and blue streamers. I dream with the cries of tried and true dreamers. I'm a chant that rises and rings. There is hope where my change sings. Though some don't understand it, those windmills of mysteries, I sing with all the planet and its hills of histories. I hum with a hundred hearts, each of us lifting a hand. I use my strengths and my smarts, take a knee to make a stand. I'm bright as the light each day brings. There is love where my change sings. I show others tolerance, though it might take some courage. I don't make a taller fence, but fight to build a better bridge. I talk not only of distances from where and how we came, I also walk our differences to show we are the same. I'm a movement that roars and springs. There's a wave where my change sings. Change sings where? There, inside of me. Because I'm the change I want to see. As I grow, it grows like seeds. I am just what this world needs. I'm the voice where freedom rings. You're the love your bright heart brings. We are the waves starting to spring, for we are the change we sing. We are what the world is becoming, and we know it won't be long. We all hear change strumming. Won't you sing along? That is such a beautiful book, and I think it really reminds us that we are the change that we want to see in the world, as wiser folks have said. And um, we saw her make a difference and not by doing anything super big. And I think sometimes we think, what can I do? I'm just one little person. Um, but we saw how her and her friends um, would pick up trash and that's something anyone can do to make our communities cleaner and um, protect the world, uh, to protect the earth. Uh, they were bringing food to people who needed food. Uh, they were, um, being tolerant. And if people didn't want to hear their message, they said, that's okay. And they found someone else. Um, and just doing a lot of really wonderful things throughout their community. And it's something to remember that even though we are just one person, we can make a difference. Even if it's something that seems a little small, all of us working together makes big change. So I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye. Friends, let us take a few moments to think on the joys and the concerns of our community in a moment of silence, and then I'll close this with a few words. We are born 
into the middle of the human story and we will leave it in the middle. We cannot change what came before and we do not know what comes after. Let us make the most of our middle and help make the story matter. Amen. Shalom. Blessed be. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and by this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share. And by this we live. During the month of November, Share the Plate funds will be shared with Shelter House. Shelter House is best known for their 24-7 domestic violence hotline and the confidential emergency shelter it provides for victims along with their children and pets who can stay for up to eight weeks. They receive a myriad of other services while they're there to help them get back on their feet. Please be generous for sharing our plate with Shelter House in November. Thanks. Our guest speaker this morning is Vinnie Anderson, a member of our fellowship since 2013. Vinnie is the author of several books, most recently a memoir of her career as a registered nurse entitled Nursing Shorts, Stories About Being a Nurse by a Nurse. During these past two years, We've heard a lot about the important role that nurses and other caregivers have played in the war against COVID-19. Polls show that the public holds nurses in high respect. Vinnie, who began her career as a registered nurse in 1967, will be the first to tell you that nursing education and the nursing profession have undergone major changes since then. Some things, however, as Venny will share, have not changed about nursing or nurses. Nurses can and do make positive differences in their patients' lives. In Venny's words, nursing isn't what we do, it's who we are. Venny will be joining us after the service at our Zoom coffee hour. Please come and join in our discussion. Good morning. My name is Vinnie Anderson, and I've been a member of UUFEC since 2013. Prior to that, I was a UU in Illinois, in my congregation in Southern Illinois, since 2002. And before that, in my heart and soul, I was a UU before I ever knew there was anything as wonderful as Unitarian Universalism. I've been asked to speak to you this morning from my perspective as a retired registered nurse. I decided I wanted to talk about making a difference. I think most human beings want to feel that they've made an effort to be of difference, that, that their lives have made a difference in some way, a positive difference. The differences we make can take a variety of forms. If you're a parent or you work with children, you can make a real difference. If you're a scientist and you add to the body of human knowledge, of course you make a difference. If you're a writer, artist, or musician, or any other 
uh, contributor to the arts, you certainly do make a difference. Whatever you do in your life, you can make a difference, especially if you recognize the opportunities to do so. I knew at a young age that I wanted to make a difference with my life, and I knew fairly on, early on that I wanted to be a nurse to make those differences. For most of us in the healthcare field, it's pretty easy sometimes to know we've made a difference because we're able to see the results of what we do in our patients. Uh, we can often help people directly in ways that we see immediately. For example, we can help relieve pain. We may be able to help them regain function. We may be able to help people breathe more easily. That certainly makes a difference. We may be able to help people learn to take care of themselves or their loved ones at home. We may help to give them birth or help them to give birth. And we may also help when they or one that they love is dying. Sometimes patients and families thank us for making a difference. And then it's easy to know that we have made that difference. I worked in a variety of healthcare settings during my career. One of my favorites was OB, the obstetrics unit, in the hospital that I worked in, hospital in the town that I was born and raised in, the hospital I was born in, as a matter of fact. Besides working in labor delivery, I also taught prenatal classes for several years, usually to parents expecting their first child. I frequently got cards and notes from OB patients, grateful for my help. Some thanked me for sitting with them while they were in labor or during delivery. Others thanked me for teaching the prenatal classes that made their birthing experience easier and less scarier. Others would meet me on the street for years after I no longer worked in OB and introduce me to their preschool child or even school-aged child, thank me for helping bring that child into the world. I often had to apologize because I didn't recognize them, but they seemed to understand. When my own daughter was five years old, I had a miscarriage. It was a devastating experience. I was reassured by those in the hospital and by my friends and family that I would get well soon and be back on my feet in no time. I didn't feel sick. I didn't really think about getting back on my feet. I was grieving. They didn't seem to realize that all my discomfort was because I was grieving for the child I had lost. There was one person who did know. The little nun sat down next to me and held my hand and cried with me, and I never forgot that. Years later, even after I no longer worked at the LB department, the LB staff would sometimes page me to come up and talk to a mother who had had a miscarriage or even more devastating, a stillbirth. Many people, and that includes nurses, don't know what to say in the face of such overwhelming grief. It wasn't that I had any magic words. All I knew to say was, I'm really sorry this happened. And then I would add, if it's all right with you, I'd like to just sit with you for a while. Often that's all it took for them to begin to express their tremendous grief. When that happened, all I had to do was listen and often cry with them. When I was in nursing school, we were cautioned, don't ever get emotionally involved with your patients. That never seemed right to me, and it didn't matter anyway because I just couldn't do it. Often in the roles that I had as a nurse, there was time for me to sit and talk with patients because I did a lot of patient teaching. I taught patients about their diabetes if they were newly diagnosed, about heart attacks, uh, lung problems, all a variety of different illnesses. And while I was do talking to them about their illnesses and helping them learn how to cope when they went home, they would often ask questions and want to talk about something else. Perhaps that was because I always told them, as I always told my prenatal classes, that there was no question that was too small and there was never such a thing as a stupid question. 
Maybe all this and the fact that I was sitting down made the patients feel that they had permission to speak, telling me sometimes things that they weren't even comfortable telling their doctors. Occasionally I would learn something that I felt the doctor really needed to be told about, which I did with the patient's permission, of course. Nurses are, and always have been, busy and overworked, and I was no exception to that. However, most nurses will usually find the time to sit down and talk with a patient when they recognize that a patient or family member needs them to do that. I've read a lot of polls that tell us that nurses are held in high regard by the general public, that they're trusted than many more professionals, sometimes even more than physicians. Maybe that's because a lot of nurses tend to be good listeners and try their very best to make the time to listen. For a number of years, I had an office in the hospital just across the hall from the intensive care unit and just next door to the intensive care unit waiting room. My desk faced the door and the door opened into the hall directly in front of the ICU waiting room. Just inside my office was a revolving stand that was full of colorful patient education materials, free for the taking. People often stopped in, sometimes attracted by the materials, pick up a pamphlet, or just to ask a question, and sometimes just to talk about what was on their mind. One afternoon, a woman stepped into my office and asked if she could sit down. I said, certainly, and I put my pencil down. She obviously needed to talk to someone. What she needed to talk about was her husband, who was in the intensive care unit on life support. She and her husband had been on vacation in their motor home, driving up to southern Illinois from someplace in the south, visiting friends in a nearby town. When he became acutely ill, their friends rushed them to the nearest hospital, which was ours. He was quickly diagnosed with obstructive gallbladder disease, which required immediate surgery to save his life. Unfortunately, while on the operating table, he had a massive stroke and now was in the intensive care unit on life support on a ventilator. One doctor, the surgeon who did the man's surgery, told his wife that the patient was brain dead as evidenced by an EEG or encephalogram brainwave test that showed no brain function. However, another doctor, an internist who had been brought in on the case because of the stroke, told the wife, oh, there's always reason for hope. She was totally at a loss. She didn't know what to do. She stood up in my office and reached into her purse, and she took out a packet of papers. She held them up, and they fan-folded all the way to the floor. It was a computer printout of her husband's bill for the first week in the hospital. Her husband had always handled things. She didn't even know where the checkbook was and didn't even know what bank their account was in. She had no idea if her husband had health insurance. She knew he was too young for Medicare, but she didn't even know if he had basic health insurance, let alone life insurance. I asked her if there was anyone that she could call to help her, and she said no. She had no children. This was her first marriage, her husband's second marriage. There was a son by his first marriage, but she didn't know the man's first name, and she had no idea how to get in touch with him. I asked her if she knew where her husband's wallet was. She thought a moment and she said, it might be in the motor home. I suggested she look there, but also ask in the intensive care unit because his wallet could very well be locked up in a cabinet in there with his personal effects. And I thought perhaps in the wallet there might be an insurance card 
or perhaps some hint as to where the son was or how to reach him, and at the very least, some much-needed cash. When she left my office, I went into the intensive care unit and talked to the head nurse. She verified that she felt indeed the man was brain dead, and she felt very angry and frustrated at the internist whom she believed was giving the wife cruel, false hope. I went back to my office and I wondered if listening to this distraught woman had made any difference for her. When I came to work the next day, I found out that later that same evening, she had made the decision to have him taken off the ventilator. Maybe all she need to do, needed to do was to marshal her thoughts verbally in order to make a choice. Perhaps just listening to her did make a difference. The last few years of my nursing career involved making home health referrals, including referrals for hospice care. I mentioned earlier that many people are uncomfortable when encountering tremendous grief. People are also frequently uncomfortable talking about death, and that even includes many physicians. Making a referral for any home care, including hospice, meant that I had to go interview the patient, get an idea of what the home situation was, and explain how home health could help, and what it was all about, and how the bills would be paid. For hospice, for most of our patients who did have Medicare, that was easy because Medicare paid for 100% of hospice care, including equipment, which meant usually a hospital bed, which was necessary in many cases. However, explaining what hospice care is and what it means could sometimes be a little trickier. If the patient and family clearly knew and understood that the patient's diagnosis was terminal, then it wasn't so difficult. In those cases, I began by saying that hospice care was not about dying. It was about living, about living the best life you can for as long as you can. Occasionally, I found myself in the position of being asked to make a referral for hospice care at home and found that the patient and the family had no idea that the disease was terminal. Or perhaps they had been told, but they just didn't comprehend what they'd been told. If a preliminary conversation made it clear to me that the patient didn't understand that his diagnosis was terminal, then I would often ask him to explain to me in his own words what he felt the outcome of his illness was going to be. Often, I found that patients understood in their hearts that their disease was terminal. They suspected it even though they may not have verbalized it. I've been using the pronoun he and his and him and that's because the last 13 years of my career I worked in the VA hospital in Southern Illinois. And back in those days, almost all of our patients were males. When the patient was able to verbalize to me that he suspected that he was not going to live very long, then I would say something like, I believe you're right. Now let's talk about what we can do to make this situation as comfortable and easy for you and your family as possible. Sometimes I would ask the patient to tell me in his own words what the doctor had told him about his illness. Sometimes he didn't understand and then it became, even though it was apparent the doctor had told him, but in terms that he didn't comprehend, then it became my unhappy job to interpret what the doctor had told him. Again, patients were rarely shocked to find they had terminal illness because most of them suspected as much. Sometimes families were more reluctant to accept a terminal diagnosis than patients. At times I had to talk to families apart from the patient to try to help them come to terms with the situation. An odd situation that happened from time to time would be when the patient would tell me 
nurse, I understand. Uh, I know I'm dying, but I don't want my family to know. Then that same family would take me aside in the hall and say, we know Papa or my husband or Grandpa is dying, but we don't want him to know. In that situation, the best thing I could do was get the hospice referral in place as quickly as possible and then leave it to the experts, the hospice nurses and social workers, to take care of the semantics of the situation. Feedback from the hospice staff, usually in a phone call after the patient passed away, was usually enough to let me know I'd made a difference because they thanked me for allowing them to make a difference. Those of us who work in healthcare sometimes encounter patients and families who don't thank us for our efforts. In fact, they may even be angry and complain and get hostile. That's difficult and sometimes it's hurtful and it does make it difficult to know if you've made a difference but it doesn't mean that you haven't. It just makes it a little harder to know. No matter what our walk in life is, all of us can make a difference if we do the best we can. Sometimes we won't know that we've made that difference, but we'll always know if we did our best. Thank you for listening. As flame is to spirit, so spirit is to breath, and breath to song. Though we extinguish the flame in this sanctuary, may we tend it in our hearts until we meet again. Stars forever shine